Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram reporting to you from Tel Aviv, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you a biblical perspective on political and social current events in Israel as they happen and why they happen. What you will hear on this program will contrast sharply with the biased reporting we are receiving from most of the world media. This is a second in our four-part series about the restoration of Israel. Today we will give you a brief overview of what happened in the land preceding World War I, focusing on the Jewish Aliyah, meaning the return to the Promised Land. On the program today, what were the differences between the first and second Aliyah? What is a kibbutz? How Jewish and Arab relationships deteriorated. Finally, our panel guests will discuss some of the hard realities regarding Israel and the Israelis of that time. In 1881, the first massive wave of Jewish immigration to Israel began. And in a period of 23 years, the Jewish population in Israel more than doubled from 26,000 in 1881 to 55,000 in 1904. Moreover, this was the first time in millennia that Jews in the land established new communities, purchased new land, and cultivated it. I can't help but make a quick aside here to mention that just as God was awakening His Jewish people to begin returning to their homeland after 2,000 years, this is also the period of the Azusa Street revival when God began to awaken His church with powerful gifts of the Holy Spirit that had been dormant for much of the last 2,000 years. Returning to the subject of Israel, many of the immigrants who arrived in this first wave were established families mostly from Eastern Europe. These were predominantly religious or observant Jews who came with enough funds to purchase land, build homes, and create new communities. It's worth noting that these immigrants were aided by multiple Zionist organizations operating in Eastern Europe at the time whose sole purpose was to help Jews get to Israel in order to establish a national homeland for the Jewish people. Yet, conditions for those who arrived were far from easy, and many turned around and went back to Europe shortly after arriving, mostly because of financial difficulties. The children and the grandchildren of those who returned to Europe died in the gas chambers. Those who were determined to stick it out built the new state of Israel literally out of nothing. It's always amazing to follow God's hand in fulfilling His promises, and this case is no exception. The circumstances that caused these tens of thousands of Jews to pick up and leave Europe and take the formidable journey to Israel were so unique in so many ways, it's worth taking a quick look. In the years before 1881, the Jews in Eastern Europe suffered from a combination of troubles that led millions of them, 4.5 million to be exact, to uproot and look for a better future elsewhere. They had suffered from pogroms, violent attacks by the various militias and armies that killed hundreds of thousands of Jews. In fact, they continually faced the same type of murderous rampages as those recently carried out in Paris by Al-Qaeda jihadists. The main difference was the constant occurrence of suppression, murder, and rape for centuries by so-called Christian nations against nameless and helpless Jewish victims. But a great deluge of such pogroms that took place in 1881 became a catalyst for the first Jews to flee to the ancient Jewish homeland. 
the Jews felt compelled to leave in huge numbers and a minority of them ended up in the land of Israel. It's worth noting that the Jews who arrived stayed and succeeded in the land, were the toughest of the tough. Rashid Khalidi, a prominent Palestinian historian, claims that this natural selection meant that the Jews who fought the Arab populace of the country before and during the Israelis' 1948 independence war were the cream of the crop of the world's Jews, motivated, goal-oriented, hardened zealots who were simply better equipped for the struggle than their Arab neighbors at the time. There's one more thing that was unique to the Jews arriving in Israel. They were well organized. The Zionist organizations operating in Eastern Europe created a leadership structure on which the Jewish community in the land could thrive. This meant the Jewish community was building towards statehood from the get-go. This is something the clan-led Arab population in the land could only dream of at that time. Many of the leaders of the Zionist movement would be those who eventually led the country after its establishment in 1948. This includes well-known names like our first Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion and Prime Minister Golda Meir, our generals, our judges, public servants, and many others who held office in the first generation of our nation's existence and who had begun building the institutions of the state more than 50 years earlier. This was a huge factor in the success of the Jewish community in the years to come. A second wave of immigration, which started in 1904, was entirely different from the previous one. The Jews who arrived were young, mostly secular, and very idealistic. This wave of immigrants is responsible for the creation of a unique phenomenon, the kibbutz. This is a creation exclusive to Israel, a community of complete equality where all property is shared and all have an equal vote. This was a rare social experiment that was a powerful tool in the Jewish leadership struggle to populate the land and develop Jewish culture. Survival was the motivator that kept these tight communities in harmony. They were really almost like an extension of the underground militias that were keeping the Jews from being destroyed. The first kibbutz to be founded was the Deganya kibbutz on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, which was founded in 1909. This was the first of many to be created over the following decades which covered Israel from north to south in every region of the country. It's worth noting that many of those who founded these kibbutzim had come from communist Russia, but wanted to create a democratic socialist model without the totalitarian elements that had existed in the red communist model. I remember years ago my father remarking that the difference between communism and Israel's kibbutz structure is that the first one was ruled by a gun in your back, while the kibbutz communities were entirely democratic. Kibbutz members could join or leave at will, and all major decisions were voted upon by kibbutz members. Over the first decade of the 20th century, the Jews continued to arrive from all around Europe, and the number and percentage of Jews in the land increased rapidly. In the early 1800s, there were perhaps seven to 10,000 Jews altogether. By 1947, the Jewish population had grown to 650,000 or a third of the entire local population. But contrary to popular belief, 
the Jews and Arabs in Israel were not necessarily at odds at that time. In the eyes of the Zionist movement leaders, their intention was actually the exact opposite. Many of the Jewish community leaders envisioned a reality in which Jews and Arabs shared the land in peace. As you know, things did not work out that way. The young Jews of the second Aliyah came with an unacceptable ideology as far as the local Arabs were concerned. These Jews wanted to go back to the image of the Jewish laborer and warrior of the Bible times. They wanted to work the ground themselves, and this meant they were taking the jobs of the Arab population. The members of the first surge of Jews in the late 1800s had created many new jobs, which were quickly taken by Arabs. The members of the second Aliyah, who were poor, young, and ideological, competed with the Arabs for the work in the fields of the Jewish landowners. For a community that for the better part of 2,000 years had been oppressed and persecuted in foreign lands, taking up arms, forming militias, and working the land were big changes. They marked a major shift in the way Jews saw themselves as a people, at least in Israel. The Jews used the first decades of the 20th century to create the establishments that would one day become the government of the future state. They created a national bank, a land registrar, a national committee. They trained armed forces, judges, and necessary officials. They began a dialogue about the nature of the future state. In short, the Jewish population took all the necessary steps to ensure that when the day would come, they would be ready. The prophet Ezekiel saw it all 2,500 years ago, revealing that God's promise to the Jewish people would be fulfilled in the latter days. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Stay with us. We will be back with our guests who will offer their analysis on the first and second Aliyah. Maos Israel Ministries is a Messianic Jewish nonprofit organization based in Tel Aviv. We exist to be a witness of the good news to the people of Israel through outreach, discipleship, and raising up godly leaders. We translate and publish outstanding faith books in Hebrew and powerful testimony books to reach non-believers. We have a Hebrew outreach website with original media content produced by our team. We support the Hebrew-speaking congregation Tiferet Yeshua in Tel Aviv. We sponsor and host seminars and conferences. We support our Arab Christian brothers who love Israel and the God of Israel. Our I Stand With Israel Fund serves as a benevolence outreach, meeting the practical needs of Israeli believers. Our dream is to see God's promises fulfilled until the day when all Israel will be saved. If you want cutting edge information about the end times, sign up for Shira Salkaram's newsletter. I have been reading it for years, and as far as I'm concerned, it was the only one newsletter I would read having to do with end time Bible prophecy right from Israel. It would be the Maos newsletter. Sign up today. One of Mao's major activities is hosting nationwide conferences for Messianic believers and leaders in Israel. Events like Equip Conferences for Leaders, the Israel-China Kingdom Destiny Conference, and Promise Keepers Conferences help Israeli believers grow in faith and advance our vision. These conferences also establish strong connections within the worldwide body of Messiah and provide tools to reach the lost, from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth.
Welcome back to Israel Frontline. Our panel guests are now ready to discuss some of the questions regarding Israel before World War I. Joining me today are Mati Shoshani, Director of Operations for TBN Israel, Shani Ferguson, co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, and Albert Vexler, Deputy Director of Global Aliyah. And all three of them are from Jerusalem. Best Thank city in the world. Thank you for being right. here. Thank you. Albert, question, why are there religious Jews living in Israel today that don't recognize Israel? Why? And what percentage you Well, it's, it's, it's a very good question, but I think um, we have to start from the, from the Zionist Congress and from the very, very beginnings of the, of the Zionist movement because, you see, it was not considered as a, a religious movement at all. Yeah. And actually, Theodor Herzl received a lot of opposition. Theodor from the Herzl, who is considered, considered to be the founder of the, the Zionist movement. Founder yeah. of the Zionist movement, so, yeah. So, so when he uh, came out with his uh, ideas of uh, creating a new homeland for the Jewish people in the, in the very borders, of course, this was also uh, discussed and debated later mm -hmm. um, when, when he saw that this was not uh, really possible at that what time. What wasn't possible? To, to bring the Jewish people back to, to the very borders that were promised to Abraham. Because there, there was actually there was no political consensus, no country, no political power wanted to have the Jewish people. But you're here. kind of blaming the lack of recognizing the state of Israel on the fact that it was started by by non-religious people, but in one sense... No, not really. What, I, what the point is different. The point is that the, the religious people, the, the rabbis, didn't uh, receive Theodor Herzl's vision as valid because they Herzl's, thought... Herzl's... The, the, the rabbis did not receive most Herzl's of them. vision. Because he was secular. Because he was secular and because they were expecting Messiah to come. That's, and well, to then, but that's a second Here's point. why, though. This is a very they complicated issue. They wouldn't have recognized issue. anybody at any point because Messiah had come. It's not just that. It goes much deeper than that. For Jews, after being in the diaspora for 2,000 years, they generally perceived the fact that they were in diaspora, and obviously, for a good reason, as God's punishment. So to yes. return to the land of Israel was stating, We've, we're done with our punishment. God's done, and they, 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 they're basically saying, wait, 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 wait a minute. We believe in God. We believe we were punished for a reason. We want God to take us back to the land. So for many of them, it's a bit tricky. They, you know, they're looking, when they say the restoration of the state of Israel, we look at the modern state of Israel. They're saying, wait, God is supposed to restore the state of Israel, and they're not sure this is God. But they're not God. even recognizing that something well, that is miraculous because it looks so because, much in the because natural. Because they don't want to. But yes, that is true. They don't want to recognize it, but they look at it and say, this doesn't look like what we expected. Let's count this as, you Which know, Which is the same mistake wrong. they made when you should yes, came. Yes, it is. Okay. I think there's another point also that was uh, called as the three oaths from the mm -hmm. Judaism that said you, that we as a nation, we cannot stand up as a wall against the, 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 the nation among which we were dispersed. We could not hasten up the day of the Lord and we could not make a mass, mass aliyah. Meaning, mm -hmm. these, these were actually taken from the book of Aliyah, Jeremiah. meaning immigration to yeah. Israel. Exactly. So, so, so the, the, the rabbis, they, they thought that this is something that would, would uh, be uh, as a rebellion against God, as you mentioned. But at the same time, this was actually one of the reasons that made the Jewish population so passive. And, and they were expecting, they were, they were to the last moment, even in the gas chambers, they were expecting the Messiah to come and take them by hand and take them to the promised land. But the, 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 these, these ideas that were so prevalent in the Judaism at that time, the idea was you cannot do it on your own. And, and they were perceived as secular Jews doing something God had promised on the road. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you hit the, the exact point. The language was confusing to them. They were expecting it to be a Messiah on a, you know, on a horse. It was supposed to be something supernatural, miraculous. And instead, it was a secular Jew Herzl, who's you know the, the the father of the Zionist movement, who's using a completely secular language, saying like the other people in Europe, we should go back to Israel and have our own land, 
and so on and so forth. And they're like, this is what, isn't what we were expecting. We were expecting something, you know, fire and brimstone. We were expecting something really dramatic. You know, dramatic. Right. And this is not dramatic at all. This is just a but bunch of secular okay. Russian speakers so coming the, to Israel. The, you know? <laughs> that, that's what they saw. With their vodka and their wine. Yeah. So there's two things, though, that should be mentioned. One is this is an extremely, extremely, extremely small group of people. It's in Israel. In, in Israel. Well, today, you know, yeah. There are some that are outside of Israel. They usually uh, come during Independence Day and throw rocks at the, you know, the parades, and they, they go, they're in New York, and they wear the Palestine flag. And, uh, okay, so in one sense, they're very small. However, the, I think These are just the people who are, who are actively opposed to the state of Israel existing. Yes, yes. Everyone else is, may, might have not... Is different happy degrees. or might have a question. Different but degrees. Yeah. Act, the, the fact that they're actively opposed, as opposed to kind of just saying, well, we don't agree with this, or is, is, you know, they go as far as going to meet with Ahmadinejad and, and embracing him. This, and, is, and, and, this is Neturei Karta, and yeah. we talk about 400 families. Right. So, yeah. Say yeah. the but name of that group there's again. There's more than 400 believing families, and they're not as well known as these 400 families. Sure, of they make Nejad. a lot of noise, for sure. Yeah, they're good at PR, good for them. But uh, at, the, at the same time, I think that the, the whole thing with the, with the Zionism, the whole thing with the return of the Jewish people to the land, because it was perceived as a uh, secular movement, and because it was perceived as done against God's initiative, against God's uh, mm -hmm. action and his plan, mm -hmm. uh, the rabbis were, were very much against it. Okay, so this is a secular movement, but I think it's very interesting that when some of those people suggested that maybe it would be a better place to go to Uganda instead of to the Holy Land, and, and the people, there was something in them that said, no, 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 no. It's most of the Russians who said, no, no, no. Because I think the, the whole Uganda idea came because uh, Herzl was very, very pragmatic. So he saw that there was no way. I mean, he was talking to Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was talking to, try to talk to Turkish Pasha. He saw there's no way so he, he can So he tried to talk to here. the Turkish Ottoman people. He tried to talk to British. And but nobody was nobody willing was to willing. help. So the, the, the British brought up the idea of Uganda. That was, that was their idea. Again, we need to remember this is before the British controlled Israel. And the exactly. Ottomans were controlling Israel and yes. strongly opposed to Jews coming to the land. Yes. So it was a Muslim government that in 1917 switched over to a Christian government. And then everything, again, as God always does, in a very unanticipated way, unexpected way, allowed the people to come back to, the, to Israel. So, so when they presented this idea, the whole idea with Uganda, yeah. Yeah. of course they met a lot of opposition. And the opposition was interesting. It came mostly from the Russian Jews. Interesting. So they, interesting. they uh, basically uh, said, no way, we will in yeah. no way go to Uganda, the land of the promise. I, this is I would, though, also say, as much as it's called a secular movement and, and these 400 religious families would... Secular, secular is a relative it's, thing. Yeah, it is point. very relative because even when Israel was formed as a state, they had dedicated you know, to, uh, people that would um, it, it's kind of blown up into a, a big deal today, but they were, there, there was a whole sect of society that, was gonna, that the government was going to support to, to have a Torah study and prayers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like, so it wasn't just like, oh, we're just going to be yeah, the democracy right. that, I, you know. Okay, I need to uh, change the subject because I have another question. Socialism is not an attractive concept to America. Shani, I'd like you to answer this. And here we're talking about a socialist entity called kibbutz. Were there advantages to living in a kibbutz? In other words, a community, a socialized community, uh, were there disadvantages? Was the kibbutz life a healthy life? It was certainly different than anything what people know in America or Europe. Uh, well, it's, that's a huge question. In one sense, I would say it served its purpose of the time. It was a free place, so you could come and go as you wanted. It wasn't like some uh, you know, totalitarian government that would shoot you if you wanted to leave. Uh, when you come to a place and there's nothing there, then everybody pitches in, everybody has the same vision, and, and you, you give what you can, you, you, you take what you need. The second generation, I wouldn't say fared as well. They were raised in uh, the children's homes away from parents, so the kibbutzim might have made great soldiers and generals, but not necessarily great fathers. And I know a lot of people that were raised in kibbutzim, now they have their own families and they don't even know really exactly how to raise their children because they were raised in, in a kibbutz. So yes, in that on sense, the kibbutz, a... uh, at the beginning, mm -hmm. the children at night were put in children's, in children's homes, homes away the... from mm -hmm. their yeah. uh, children. Now, when I first arrived in Israel, there was great uh, you know, discussion about whether this was good or not. Now, all the kibbutzim basically 
have taken the children out of uh, right. the children's and, and, homes. Right, and that is one thing that and they should be with noted, parents. that years later, things are being privatized. Like, it was yeah. good when yeah. there was nothing. You but but here's, just, here's, like, a, here's need, a point, though. I've interviewed people who were part of the kibbutz movement at that time, and they talk about the need out of a financial point of view. Not just, it wasn't just, you know, an ideology. They say, we didn't have enough money to house everyone properly. We didn't have enough money to feed everyone properly. So we said, the kids are our future. We have to work all day in the fields, which is what they did back then. Now they have factories and stuff like that. High tech and more money than they did in the past. They said, so we're going to have one person watching over like six or seven kids, and they'll get the good food, they'll get that's, a good house. Later on, they also sort of patched onto that, this ideology and stuff like that. About the financial side, but it's, it's more. You have to put it in the, in the overall picture. Yeah. And I think that the kibbutz movement was, was a necessary thing for the survival. Of for the survival. Country. Yeah, definitely. Because you couldn't survive in this hostile environment of the you know, 20s, 30s uh, without, a without a community, supportive community. The because 1920s and 1930s. Yeah. Plus, and plus you, you, you take them, they were isolated islands in the land, surrounded yes. by very, very hostile yes. people. And so you, you come to a point that you cannot make it alone. So it's, it's something that worked for a while. And then as the times changed, and as, as the situation changes. Well, of course, there, there's a change in the kibbutz movement, and you have children, and you have parents realizing that what we missed, yes. and we should have had this and that better. But it's not only the financial side of the story, it's the no. security. But it was a very important tool to help raise up the state of Israel, because Definitely. people were in communities, they could protect each other. Plus, plus, there's another thing, you know, when they come, when, the, when these Jewish people are coming, many, you know, the first waves of Aliyah, they come yeah. from uh, pre-revolution or after revolution Russia yeah, yeah. where they have this idealistic thought that we should now create a new society that is a better society yes. but there's an interesting mix because they say we want to mix it with the ideals of the prophets so I mean for some people it's it's like worlds apart how can so you bring they weren't the entirely secular that's together, important to note yes. together with the, yeah. with the ideals of the prophets mm -hmm. but this is exactly what you get well that's it for today's Israel Frontline thank you for watching we hope we gave you insight that will help you understand Israel and her struggles. For more of my articles about Israel, sign up to the free monthly Maoz Israel Report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. Remember to join us next week for the third in our four-part series about the restoration of Israel. We will continue an overview of events causing the life and death struggle of Israel for her homeland. On behalf of our team and myself, blessings and shalom from Tel Aviv.